Uh, welcome back to Think Tech. This is Global Connections. I'm going to talk about Narendra uh, Modi's uh, visit to the United States and, and how well he did and how well the United States did uh, with our um, Rupmati Khandakar, Dr. Rupmati Khandakar. Uh, welcome to the show, Rupmati. Hello, Haji. And it's a pleasure to be with you on the show. So uh, I just love being and in interacting with you. Well, you know, the funny thing is that, um, you know, if, if Narendra Modi came to the United States and there were no Indians here, in other words, there was, you know, no large population of Indians, it would be different. But the thing is that there's a lot of Indians in the United States and they're smart and they're educated and they're articulate and sometimes they're vociferous. And yes. if there's an issue in India, when he comes here, he should expect he's going to have a little noise from that crowd because they care a lot about what happens in India and they don't mind saying so. Am I right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Remember last time we had discussed that the Indian diaspora is what uh, drives uh, this visit. It's the main uh, motivation behind this visit. We have a U.S. election in which the Indian diaspora will play a part. And uh, Indians abroad are also uh, something what presents Modi's image back in uh, India. So this diaspora as the largest, probably arguably the most successful and educated uh, diaspora, uh, like Modi calls it the Samosa caucus. So uh, the lobby is very strong, Jay. And uh, uh, this, uh, like the fervor that he creates, the political fervor that he creates by interacting with them, and reminding them of the motherland, that is uh, very motivational. And uh, it's rare to see a leader who has got this kind of charisma in which he um, involves the people with it. He asks questions to the audience, the audience responds, and then they chant, let's go back, visit your motherland. He promotes tourism, he promotes the Hindu way of life, he promotes the uh, Indian way of life, he um, represents India on the global stage and he discusses global issues. So this kind of uh, uh, comprehensive package in one leader is very, very appealing to India because we had a mute leader before this, <laughs> the Congress party leader. You have a contrast. The Congress party leader, Mr. Dr. Manmohan Singh was pretty quiet. So, and we have a very vocal, very vociferous uh, leader who will keep on talking of solar energy, global warming, climate change, uh, these things appeal to not only Indian audiences, but also it has a global, global appeal. So this is Jay in diplomacy, soft power, which he exercises. I and think part of the diaspora is, uh, is education. I mean, and it, yeah. it, it, it comes out of the, the uh, respect for education in India itself. But, but the, um, the Indian people in, in the United States have been successful because they really value education. And this this um, you know requires them to understand what's going on back in India, and it enables them to speak out and speak up. And so uh, this, I suppose, is a factor in Narendra Modi's um, um, discussion of global issues because he knows that the people he is talking to want to hear from him about it. Am I right? Yes, yes. Jay, he he pinches the uh, Indian pulse very well. Uh, you see when he talks about uh, what Indians should achieve in your country. He says, he calls them to succeed in their field. He calls them to uh, cash in on the education that they have, to contribute to the American economy. He does not say uh, come back or anything, he says visit. So there's a big difference. He doesn't, you know, we had uh, governments before this crying about brain, 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 but he is the one who uh, has, uh, accepted that this potential of brain drain brings revenue to the country in such a way through the tourism. It's fine that Indians are succeeding abroad. Doesn't mean they have to come back. But this brain drain, which was a big issue for so long, he's trying to make it acceptable that Indians are succeeding globally. Yeah, oh, that's a good idea. And that's the way, that's the, way the world works now. You know, he's recognizing a reality. Um, yes. The idea of... Uh, you know, telegraphing money back home, I suppose, is still in play, but but that's not terribly important. And it's not terribly important to try to bring people back um, the way China does. China tries to, you know, keep a leash on people <laughs> wherever they go. 
and try to get them back by enticing them to come back. Anyway, and which is hard these days. The other thing I, I wanted to ask you is, uh, so, okay, so Modi comes and he wants, he wants to talk about the diaspora. He wants to talk to the diaspora. Um, he wants to mend fences, right, uh, with Biden. I mean, there's been a little stress and strain over his failure to support um, Ukraine and his, um, you know, romance. Uh, I don't know if you could call it that, his, his connection with Putin, which is especially in jeopardy right now. Um, and maybe with, you know, with China too. And I guess he wants to show that th the stronger tie, the stronger connection is with the United States on a, a cultural basis, on a diaspora basis, um, on a, you know, philosophical basis, a moral basis, a governmental basis. I mean, really, we are very close to India and it seems that, you know, we go on and on uh, in the post-war post years, we get closer. That's where it is. I mean, it's not totally tight, but it's close and closer. So um, what is what has he come for to talk to Biden about? Uh, am I right to say that he wants to mend fences and he wants to get closer diplomatically to the United States? Jay, uh, you're absolutely right on this. And uh, the way they present India-US relations is that relationship between the world's largest democracy and the world's oldest democracy. This is a, a tag that they have put for a long time. People may get bored of it, but uh, we really can't because you can't underscore the fact that two democracies never go to war with each other. So this is a bond that we have to really nurture and keep holding on to. And uh, this kind of uh, relationship between two democracies, which now have focused between, it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship. Jay, if you see previous uh, visits, uh, this was a state visit. This was an official state visit. Now, why the symbolism is important, the ceremonial state dinner and the White House uh, uh, reception that he got, because there are three tiers of uh, receptions for a, a head of state in any country. And this was the highest awarded to him. Earlier, we had a, a visit, a working visit but never a state visit. Now, a state visit is when you have the canyons roaring and, uh, you know, everything that comes with it, the fa fanfare that comes with it. So this kind of a red carpet welcome for Modi was not uh, just friendship or just adjustment. It was because two of, one, uh, two of the biggest economies were signing a deal for defense, uh, for procurement of uh, aeroplanes, the Boeing one, that will provide 1 million jobs across 34 states in America. So that's a big deal for Biden when unemployment is staring in the face, when the recession is hurting everybody. So that is a big deal that Modi comes in and brings these jobs in. Secondly, India, India today now has US as the biggest defense supplier. Look at the days back in the Cold War when we were siding with Russia and uh, US was... Uh, siding with Pakistan, which is now a failed state. And uh, these kind of uh, considerations of the other person in the bilateral relations always marred our relationship. Jay, it was never US-India. It was always uh, is India vis-a-vis uh, -vis Pakistan, in uh, US vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Pakistan, uh, was vis-a-vis -vis China. So this kind of uh, consideration of the other was really hampering us. And this was the first uh, visit in which we have not seen any discussion on Pakistan, just to mention of the quad, uh, which is a trigger to uh, China that you keep your eyes open, we are, uh, we are right down your neck. So that kind of uh, a pressure point on China, but US knows that uh, uh, China is very close to Russia and Russia Indian friendship is uh, like we discussed in a, a previous program, that they have stood the test of time so that they will continue. But that doesn't mean we can't move over and above. So this was a maturity in the diplomacy of US and India. There was no bickering, there was nothing. It was what I can give you, what you can give me, and we do give and take. Now, when they supply drones, Jay, it makes uh, 31 drones, uh, which make our Army, Navy, and uh, um, Air Force much stronger. So this uh, defense upgradation, and it's one of the largest 
technology transfer since the 2008 nuclear deal. So uh, uh, US is coming ahead with their uh, initiatives and India is, uh, with, uh, you know, is lapping it up like anything else. So, <laughs> well, uh, it, it, works, it works well for India. I mean, uh, all, all well. this is good, yeah. Very, very much, very much. And um, India as a source of education, technology, investment and manpower works well for the US. So, uh, and to have a marketplace, you know, there was trade tariffs during the Trump administration, there was bickering of trade tariffs on American walnuts, apples, uh, almonds, they have all been removed. So the mm, Indian good. market is open to American produce. The make in America concept in America and the make in India concept in India is displacing the same made in China concept big time, Jay. Mm. So that is uh, a big boost to the national domestic economies in the face of globalization. They both are keeping globalization alive, but also encouraging their national produce. There was a time in which, uh, Jay, if you remember, we never found a single product which was not made in China. Today we are, we are diversifying it and we are getting things which are made in our own country also. So that's a big leap ahead. Well, there's a lot of things being made in India. Um, you know, it's, it's becoming a manufacturing center. Not only that, it's becoming a, it already is a tech center. And don't forget the movies. I, I, <laughs> wa I watched a, an Indian movie the other night on Netflix and I said, gee whiz, this is a lot more, you know, sophisticated than the Bollywood. Um, mm -hmm. This is a serious movie. It has a global message. Uh, it is it is important that we hear from India on these kinds of things. I mean, this is art, and it, it, it's it's done in a way that appeals everywhere. So that's another kind of production, if you will. So what did what did Biden want out of this deal? We know we know that it served Modi for sure, as you describe it. But what did Biden want? Why did he do this? Why did he spend the time and the money um, you know, to get close to invite? I suppose the invitation must have come from Biden. Uh, why? See, now there's a big uh, trajectory in Biden's uh, relationship with Modi. He was in the administration when they denied the visa to Modi when he was chief minister. Mm. And now today he is the one who's giving a state reception to him. Mm. So, uh, there are no permanent enemies, no permanent friends on the international forum. That is, <laughs> that is a line which holds uh, good in their relationship. And for Biden, Jay, um, he makes uh, effort to come forward, to meet Modi, to talk to him. Because you see, he is um, open-minded and he is not uh, hampering himself. If he, he's not playing those kiddish games in kindergarten that you sided with him, so I will not side with you, and you are with him, so I will not talk to you. Then he's rising above, and that's a that's a that's a sign of a leader of a of the hegemon of the uh, uh, global order, isn't it? If you mm. talk in that way, he is supposed to take everybody and go ahead and progress out of it. If you just meet everybody and uh, you know there's nothing coming out of it. How will it help? Today he knows the Indian diaspora, or uh, you know, how many meetings were arranged Jay, between uh, Elon Musk and uh, uh, what is that? Modi. Uh, there was talk of the Starlink coming to India. So this kind of a comprehensive meeting serves uh, Biden well because his businesses go abroad. His his uh, um, uh, agenda is ahead. How many people followed the, this? How many people started knowing about Biden? How many people felt, yeah, Biden is maybe, you know, uh, conducive to a, a step ahead in bilateral relations is a very big thing in diplomacy because a small thing can just take you back several years. So this kind of uh, open-hearted reception by Biden is uh, very, very important. Was Biden interested in advocating for a change in Modi's position on buying Russian uh, gas and oil. Uh, was he trying to get uh, Modi to uh, support Ukraine instead of Russia? Was there any discussion of that? Was there any result in that? Uh, is there any change in the, the complexion of that whole um, you know, series of issues in our relationship? Jay, India has agreed to only 20% of 
the US uh, um, sponsored resolutions in the United Nations. And uh, it's abstained from all the uh, resolutions which affected Russia. And uh, uh, thankfully, there was no, no bringing up of the Ukraine issue. And uh, I mean, it's maturity, I say it again, because the leaders are very well versed in their stand which they are taking. Nobody's going to dictate terms to the other because everybody is profiting from this chain. Whenever there's a war in any part of the world, remember, the top-notch flowers always prosper because of the sale of ammunition, because of the movement of uh, money or financial resources. So the top powers don't lose out when there's a war in the international uh, order. So this kind of talking it goes on, but th that is not affecting bilateral relations. That is a very big thing. So the thrust on democracy rather than the Ukraine-Russia conflict, which is, I think, now a regularized uh, uh, tenet of the <laughs> world order. Nobody's bothering about them. That is very wrong. Uh, so this stand that they took during this bilateral meet was was ignoring everything else and just focusing on US, India, US, India. Like he said, the AI, the American Indian uh, friendship was at the core of talks this time. Well, putting it all that together and considering, you know, the remarkable um, historic nature of this meeting, and I'm, I'm only disappointed that neither you nor I were invited to the state dinner. And I hope <laughs> that next, next time they, they watch more think tech and they do invite us. Anyway, do you, do you see a, a shift here? Um, do we have a pivot of any kind? What, what does it mean going forward? Uh, how do you expect this will affect relations? Jay, now we, we see that five huge, huge, I mean huge in the sense that the technology transfer, the monetary transfer uh, deals, which took place, the military aspect of it, which took place um, were path breakers, uh, in the sense that there's unrestricted bond between the both of them. And uh, uh, this kind of a, a path which they create amongst themselves, it makes them the strongest, not only the largest and the oldest democracy, the largest market and the biggest uh, economy in the world collaborating makes other people shiver. It really makes them shiver because both of them can sustain each other on their own just in the way that China and Russia can sustain each other. If India and the US go ahead with this, they can sustain each other. The US products can have a huge market uh, in the Indian this who are buyers today. There is a lot of money in uh, India where they are setting up uh, the entire, the drone making, like I said, the drone making, they're going to set up a factory or assembling plant in uh, India. Now, Apple, like we discussed last time, went to now, now currently at 2,000 uh, billion. I mean, uh, that way, kind, that kind of sales uh, Apple has got. They never expected it. So, yeah, well, I, India is a much safer place uh, for American companies to go to. America, yes. A much safer place for American investors to invest in. Way safer than China, gee whiz. Way safer than China. We can't underestimate that fact that uh, China was the um, only place that uh, manufacturers had to go to. But when you have an alternative, you can, if you want to set, if you really want to set up a business in China, you can always bargain and negotiate that if you don't allow me this, 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 we'll go to India. Just next door, just same price, just same manpower, uh, uh, cheaper labor available. So we will set up. So that increases the bargaining power of a businessman and an entrepreneur only needs profit in his business. So, so do, you, uh, do you think there'll be more? Do you think there'll be more business um, between the U.S. and India as a result of the meeting between Modi and Biden? Yes, Jay, because we have come a long way from the sanctions, nuclear sanctions. Uh, after the uh, nuclear test that we had, we had sanctions, and military uh, give and take was a far-fetched option for India, U.S. And today, when U.S. becomes the biggest uh, um, uh, supplier of arms and ammunition to India, which we invest so heavily in. So a buyer for American defense uh, equipment is a huge thing because um, India 
has grown its business from almost nothing in 2014 to around 2000 billion today so that leap just check uh, it's 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 not a small amount mm. But can we talk for a minute um, about some of the flies in the ointment as I would look at them? Uh, there would come, I mentioned to you before the show, there were some news articles that were, you know, somewhat uh, less than perfect, um, <laughs> reflecting a less than perfect trip by, by Renfro Modi. One is he had a press conference and some reporter for the Wall Street Journal, and I, and I don't know the, um, you know, the, the, the cultural names well enough, I don't know if it was an Indian uh, uh, reporter or a Pakistani reporter, uh, asked him about, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, civil rights, I suppose, in India. And, um, and he said there were really no big problems. And uh, at that moment, uh, there, was a, there was an online, a series of online attacks against this woman reporter uh, from yeah. people who were, I guess, uh, supporting Modi. So his his, um, what do you call it, his uh, support group went after her. And then yeah. there was all this condemnation of the support group and people who would go after her for the question she posed. Uh, but that's regrettable because that, that's a, a fly in the ointment on his trip. Um, what do you think happened there? What was going on? Yeah, at the conference, they, were, they didn't have time. They were short of time. So they took around two, three questions. And the framing of the question, Jay, is legitimately wrong because when she says some people say that India is a democracy. Now you're talking to a leader who has been elected in pan-India elections of 1.4 billion people who have voted properly and elected him not once. Over a period of 2010 years, this man has been elected by 1.4 billion. Uh, and when they say that just people say about India being a democracy, that's wrong because India is a legitimate and uh, practicing and vibrant democracy with institutions and everything. But uh, this narrative that they are uh, talking of, a communal narrative or like uh, Modi is against Muslims, Jay, I'll tell you, he has done uh, away with the triple talaq, which was a, a, a derogatory, uh, tenet of uh, Muslim Islamic uh, things for Indian women. They could easily just leave their wives and get back. Get, I'll discuss with you on another time. And 14% of the Indian population is Muslim. But has have you ever heard any scheme that is done by Modi which says that this scheme is only available for uh, Hindus or this scheme is not available to Muslims? He never says that there is no discrimination in any of his schemes or any of his projects on the basis of religion. So why the narrative? Why the false narrative? This kind of, uh, um, because they have nothing to talk against him in development, in infrastructure, in economy. So they bring up this point, uh, the communal angle to it, and then they stretch it like a rubber band. And I, I remember I had spoken to you about this, that reporters are being paid very well to speak against Modi. The people who will speak for Modi may not be paid, but the people who speak against Modi are very well paid. They, are, they generate a lot of income. And uh, this kind of uh, uh, narrative of minority, uh, uh, what is that? Subrogation is wrong because there, there was a part of Indian politics which thrived on minority appeasement. They use them as vote banks. But having, uh, if you say you're a Hindu, doesn't mean you're saying a Muslim is bad. So this kind of narrative against Modi, when he is reviving Hindu uh, uh, temples or when he's promoting yoga, doesn't mean he's going against the Islam way of life. India mm. is a Hindu majority country. Mm. So no. if somebody says that they are a Hindu Rashtra or whatever, Akhan Bharat or whatever, it doesn't mean that they are going against the Islam. Everybody coexists. But saying that he is against this and he's against that, that is wrong. Now, Barack Obama somehow got involved in this conversation. Yeah. Uh, God knows why, really. I mean, you know, he, he was very friendly with Modi. He visited India, didn't he? And, um, and, I, and I think, um, you know, it was really um, uh, inappropriate for him to say what he said. He said that if, if India doesn't solve the Hindu-Muslim contention, 
it will something about fall apart, come apart, which is a, you know a gross overstatement, I would say, from what I know. And I don't know why Barack Obama got into that, made that statement. And then, of course, as you say, there are those who are looking for raw meat. They're looking yes. for contention points, and they pounced on that statement. And before you know it, um, you know, you have Pakistan weighing in, saying, oh, um, you know, India doesn't treat the, the Muslims well enough, and everybody is all excited about it. And I'm saying, what? What's all that about? It doesn't sound like, you know, it's much ado about nothing is what I think. But well, tell me your thoughts about Barack Obama's comment. Yeah, that was unnecessary. Uh, India has a population which is larger than a Muslim population, larger than the entire population of Pakistan. Now, if India was going against Muslims or in, Muslims were in such a pathetic state in uh, uh, India, I don't think so many Muslim countries would have awarded Modi with their highest civilian honors. He just went after America to Egypt and got the order of the Nile. So, uh, I mean, if he was such a monster, I don't think they would have given him these uh, awards. <laughs> and Barack Obama, Barack Obama, I think, see, Jay, Modi and Biden together, the state dinner, the pomp and fanfare was the most talked about event on the global stage. So kind of jealousy <laughs> or whatever, he's thinking of how Biden has stepped out of his shadow and uh, coming out to the global. Biden was always his uh, number, right wing man. He was never dominating ahead of Obama and so many, so much talk about Biden, 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 Biden in India, in America and everywhere. And so many things being done, Jay. I mean, so many presidents would have just stayed back and not said, let's not give this predator technology or let's not give the drone technology. This guy has just signed off everything. And there is a bridge which has been built, which is a two-way bridge. So that was a very strong uh, initiative or maneuver on the part of an American president. And I don't think uh, it went down with Barack Obama. And appeasement of minorities, like the Indian finance minister gave him a reply that uh, six Muslim countries were invaded during his time, during his tenure. So if he had any consideration of, of uh, Muslim rights, he should have never invaded that. So that is a strong statement to make. And I think, enjoy the right. Whatever is the wave in the uh, global uh, uh, scene, enjoy it. Why prick? I mean, there is no reason to prick. He's come back to India. Yeah. There is a Muslim yeah. festival being celebrated. There's no problem in it. I mean, yeah, it struck me as uh, really um, uh, inappropriate because uh, hmm. we're trying to build relationships here, yes. not, not find raw meat complaints. Um, the other thing I noticed, uh, this is, uh, I mentioned to you before, is um, in Madras, the Supreme Court of Madras um, found recently within the last day or two uh, that um, women have greater rights perhaps than we thought in division of property with men. Um, and uh, you mentioned before the, uh, the show that now it's always been that way. But tell me, what is the history of that issue? And does the, does the Supreme Court um, decision in Madras uh, account for a significant change? Yes, so there must be a case which has been filed for equal rights, but uh, in India, uh, on, on paper, there is an equal inheritance for boys and girls. In Islam, the division of uh, property is one portion to the boy, half a portion to the female. So now when they rule in the court that there is going to be uh, equal division between men and women. So that's a big thing because uh, it's a step forward. And uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, uh, but India is bringing in the Uniform Civil Court J. That will bring in, uh, that will do away with the religious boards that we have and make it a more democratic society in which everybody has to go for appeal, registration, and um, uh, delegation, deliberation to an Indian court rather than your religious board. Now, J, when this will come up, there will be a huge communal cry because what will be destroyed is the religious boards and those religious boards are Islamic boards. So they will say they're taking away everything. But now when they're making it more democratic, they will say, no, he's going against the Islamic way of life. <laughs> Remember that. <laughs> <laughs> well, good for them. I, I told you before that I believe my, my law school roommate uh, may be mm. on that court. <laughs> so good for wow. him. <laughs> it's so a long nice. time ago. 
he was a he was a law student with me. Well, well, thank you very much, Rupmati. This is really important that we understand the nature of the visit um, and how how it was organized and what happened and how it was different from previous visits and and the new and the newfound connection really between yes. Modi and Biden and, and the country here. Uh, we need to have um, a sort of a global connection on that. That's why we call the show Global Connection, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Right, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Rupmati Kandakar, uh, a um, an academic and uh, associated with the United Nations, who's an author and a, a a global thinker, if you will. Thank you so much, Rupmati. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jay. Aloha, Jay. Thanks so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click on the like and subscribe buttons on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And please check out our website, that's thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.